Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on this uh, second of two in a series for a special YouTube Live EDU on air. Before we begin, I wanted to point out some accessibility features we have on today's broadcast. As you can see, we have a wonderful um, American Sign Language interpreter and also using our Google Slides captions tool, I'm able to come down here and turn on closed captions. So this means that live, as I'm speaking on this broadcast, as our guest star is speaking on this broadcast, uh, the um, intelligence in the slides will just be hearing our speech and live transcribing them at the bottom of your screen. To note, this was not prescripted. This is happening live. So as, uh, as my um, guest star and I, again, get excited or perhaps speak a little bit more quickly, sometimes the speech recognition might um, not transcribe exactly what we're saying. So please bear with us, but we will do our best to speak, speak slowly and clearly so that uh, we can make sure everyone has accessibility to this, to this feature. Additionally, uh, for those of you who uh, weren't able to hear me before, we have our incredible uh, American Sign Language interpreter uh, below me, as you can see. And so she'll also be providing that accommodation so everyone can learn all of the great wisdom that we're about to hear from our guest. So with that, uh, I'll introduce myself. For those of you who didn't tune in last week or haven't seen others in the series, my name is Jenny Magara. I am the Global Head of Education Impact here at Google. Um, I am a career educator and uh, a mother, and I'm very, very delighted to once again introduce Dr. Mark Brackett from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, who will be our guest star today, bringing in so many insights. He has written an amazing book that I recommend to everyone called Permission to Feel. Uh, for those of you who are looking for an end of summer uh, book to read or beginning of fall, highly, highly recommend this. Um, and he also has created a number of incredible tools and frameworks that educators and parents like myself have found um, deeply impactful for not only young people, but full-size people as well. <laughs> Last week, we talked about adult emotional regulation, and today we're gonna talk about digging into these concepts for our, our young folks. So thank you, Mark, for being with us today. Thank you for having me again. I'm excited to be here. So uh, for those of you who watched last week, um, you got to hear Mark and I, you, you got to hear actually a little bit of Mark giving me some therapy and helping <laughs> me as an adult, as a mom, learn how to regulate my emotions. But today, Mark, I'm really interested in how we can regulate the emotions of, of the young people in our lives. And as, as I mentioned last week, I have a daughter, Lucy, who's two years old. She actually turns mm -hmm. two, two on Monday, ah. um, who has a lot of big feelings. And um, last week we talked about how my daughter's school um, uses your ruler framework. And you mm -hmm. helped me understand how I could use that as an adult. Um, but is, do you have any suggestions um, for how, as a parent, I support my child's school using ruler in my home? I, like we're really trying to bridge that home to school uh, connection. So what can I do as a mom to really reinforce that in her school? Yeah. So, I mean, importantly, Ruler is an approach to social and emotional learning that is about all the adults, you know, who are raising and teaching kids using the same language. So actually we can go to the mood meter just as a way to start our day. So the um, this is our tool. We call it the mood meter. It's uh, an evidence-based tool to help us build greater awareness about our feelings. So the schools that use Ruler have posters, they use virtual, you know, they use Google Classrooms to do this. They use many different ways to make it available even in remote learning circumstances. But very briefly, we've got these four quadrants. So we got yellow, red, blue, and green. So yellow, high energy, pleasant feelings. So, you know, the happy, excited, optimism family. The green, the calm, content, tranquil family. The blue, the down, lonely, sad family, and the red has the anxiety and the anger family. So let me let me just start by asking you how you're feeling today, Jenny. I'm feeling um, 
a bit overwhelmed. I have a lot on my plate today and I'm uh -huh. trying to get ready for my daughter's birthday and get everything done at work. I need to clean my apartment. So I have a lot <laughs> on my plate. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. Well, that makes two of us. So maybe we can help each other out. Um, tomorrow's my birthday, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so your daughter and I are both Virgos. Um, <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, so I'm feeling, I'm excited to be with everybody and to do this with you. But like in the background, I've got like, oh my God, I got so much to do. And I bet a lot of the parents who are watching are probably feeling that way too, right? Like in the moment, you're probably feeling, all right, let's get into this. Yeah. But like in the background, you've got like, oh my goodness, I've got so much to do and handle. Does that make sense? Yes, oh, there's always that like, other voice in my head that like I'm trying to focus on the now, but also thinking about my to-do list all the time. So one thing, you know, related to your feelings and your, and your daughter's feelings or any adults, uh, children's feelings is this is a great way to start the day at breakfast and you just sit down at breakfast and you just check in. So how are you feeling about going to school today? You know, what color are you in today, honey? Um, what might be causing that feeling? You know, why are you feeling that way? And that gives you a glimpse into what you might anticipate. You know, that if you're, oh, I'm feeling down today, mommy. Oh, really? Well, tell me more. Or I'm excited. Oh, that's wonderful. Tell me more about that. And so, you know, learning about how your kid is feeling first thing in the morning can really be helpful to support you in thinking about the strategies that can help your child grow. I love that. And I love the visual nature of this. I, my daughter does have this in her classroom and I think it's so thoughtful as an educator because it's so, it's so scaffold. So she's not obviously able to, to quite read all the words on this yet, but she can see the colors. And I know mm -hmm. that they um, narrate feelings all the time and help her understand like the red association, the yellow association. And so um, I, I, I never thought to print this out, but I think after this call, I'm going to add to my to-do list and I'm going to put this out and put this, in our kitchen and maybe start totally. doing that with her. I it's a, it. it's a really easy tool. And then you do it, you know, when, I, when she comes home from school, right? You do another check-in. So how, how, you know, how are you in, how are you feeling? How is school today? And you can even get more specific. Like as your, as your daughter gets older, let's say they're in middle school or something like that. You can say, you know, so, you know, how are you feeling about math and science? And, mm -hmm. and you can literally find out like how your kids are feeling about the different classes they're taking, the different subjects they're learning. And that might help you find, oh, my kid is anxious in social studies, but they're feeling calm and phys ed and they're feeling, you know, excited about math. And it just gives you greater insight, you know, into the things that are going well and the things that might not be going well. That's, that's such a good tip. And, you know, speaking of, of the subjects, so I'm going to put my educator hat back on. Mm -hmm. And so um, in addition to being a mom, like I said, I, I was a lifelong or a career educator and I was also a school administrator. And so as I think about, um, you know, the world of social emotional learning and emotional intelligence, yep. I know a lot of school and district leaders right now are thinking about the many things we're trying to untangle with distance learning and keeping learning going. And so in last week's, um, or sorry, last week, gosh, see, that's how, how uh, scatterbrained I am. In two days ago, our, our mm -hmm. part one of this session, I heard folks asking about balancing um, staff who are saying, hey, I don't have time to explore emotions. I am trying to figure out how to teach math, how to teach science, mm -hmm. how, to, how to do the teaching bit. So how do we help folks understand why emotions matter and why it's worth investing the time into digging into this for young people? Yeah, so let's go to the next slide because um, I can repeat this slide over and over and over again and it's to a superintendent, to a commissioner of education. Literally, um, how we feel drives everything. So when people say, I don't have time for feelings, I say, you don't have time not for feelings. And because we know that how our children feel is driving whether or not they're paying attention. Right? Think about it. Your children learn what they care about. And I think importantly, what we know from our research is that a lot of our kids have come off of a spring and a summer where they've been frustrated, they've been bored, they've been overwhelmed, they've been sad, they've been lonely. And those feelings influence concentration. I mean, I can tell you from my own life, you know, here I am as an adult, I'm a 50, 
soon to be one year old guy um, who uh, was a C and D student. And I, a lot of people say, how could that be? Like you're, like you're a professor. I'm like, now I am, but I was a terrible student. And it wasn't because of my intelligence. I'm obviously you know, a pretty smart guy. But my, the real reason was, is that I had a lot of strong feelings as a kid. I was anxious about school. I was anxious around certain subjects and I had no strategies. So I just sat in that classroom with my brain activated, worrying about, I was bullied also, worrying about friendships, worrying about safety, survivor mode, not learning mode. So I think every parent needs to understand how the brain operates. And then when you do, you start wanting to know how your kid is feeling because you want to be able to support them in managing their feelings effectively. And that goes to decision-making, relationships, um, our health. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, I'll just say this and then we can move on, is oftentimes people think of like, well, my cognition, you know, my cognitive abilities are what make me successful. And what I have found over and over and over again is that people who are smart, right, they can do okay, of course. But if you don't have the skills and the strategies to deal with your feelings, like, have you ever gotten harsh feedback? Sure, sure. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I don't like that presentation. I'm like, Ugh. you know, <laughs> or like, you could have done this better. Or, you know, uh, and students are getting this all day long in school, right? The adults who are teaching them, the parents who are raising them or, you know, do this and don't do that. I don't like that. And you should do it this way. And unless our kids have the strategy to deal with all those feelings, the frustration, the overwhelm, the disappointment, oftentimes they don't achieve their dreams. That's, that's something that's so um, um, squarely right. I can actually like remember, like physically remember being in a space of working on something so hard as a student and, and putting it in front of an adult and not, and getting harsh feedback and just feeling so, uh, demoralized and like just like deflated and not wanting to try again and, and not knowing what to do with those big feelings. So I hear you, it's such a lens and it's such a foundation for what we do. And and something you taught all of us last uh, last session on Tuesday was about not not shielding others from our feelings, like really allowing ourselves to feel it. You know, even when we um, got on in the green room today, you know, we said, how are you? And you, and you were honest. You said overwhelmed, which I think gave me permission on air. Mm -hmm. You asked me to say overwhelmed. You modeled that for me. And it's like, it's okay to have some of the red feelings and the yellow well, feelings. So I think, Jenny, that what you brought up is like a critical piece, yeah. you know, and it's why my book is called Permission to Feel, is that all emotions are information. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a bad feeling. We have been brought up in society in a culture where we're taught to judge feelings as being good or bad, right? Anxiety makes you weak. Mm -hmm. I'm a pretty successful guy and I've got anxiety. So like wrong, sorry, that doesn't, that's not true. There are plenty, plenty of very, look at how many artists, right? Have challenges with their feelings, but they can channel those feelings into creativity. So we just got to move away from the mindset that emotions are good and bad and say all of our feelings are information. Yes, anxiety, if it's if we have it for too long and it's uh, too intense, it has deleterious effects on our health and wellness. But I don't know about you. I joke about this in my workplace. I actually like to work with people who are a little bit anxious because they like they get things done right there on their toes. <laughs> So there's actually an optimal level of stress, and it's when it's and when it's when it goes over, then it becomes chronic and toxic. That's when it, things go wrong. I actually joke all the time how I wish my daughter had just a little bit more fear. She's a little dangerous, <laughs> and I would get some healthy fear to realize like maybe we shouldn't, you know, try and touch the stove or want to run into traffic. So I hear that. Um, so you, that's so good. And I, I love the idea of emotions are information, emotions are data. And and so as we're thinking about allowing ourselves to, to fully feel and acknowledge our emotions, you like the title of this is about regulation of emotion. Yes. So can you help us understand more? Like, what do you mean by regulation? So there's a lot of forms of regulation. The first is that we, the adults who are raising and teaching kids, 
we have to be able to manage our own feelings. Like you've got to be the role model. You can't like, I don't know. My, you know, I had, my mom would say things like, calm down. Like that doesn't work. very well, <laughs> Right. You got to like your facial expression, your body language has got to like match, you know, the strategy also, right. You have to even show out loud. I was talking about this with a bunch of educators yesterday. Like, when you said you're overwhelmed, right? You may think, oh, my daughter shouldn't know that I'm overwhelmed. However, if you said, you know, mommy's got a lot on her plate. She's got work. She's got to take care of you. She's got other things going on. And I have, I'm a little overwhelmed, but here's what I'm doing to help me manage my feelings. You know, what I'm saying to myself is, you know what? I'm going to be organized. I'm going to get through this. What you're demonstrating to your child is that you can have unpleasant feelings and they don't interfere like with your success and your ability to be a good parent. That is like so important. I don't know, what what, what does that bring up for you? I think I, I love it because it just, it humanizes the experience for me. And I think that I come from, you know, the stereotypical background where, you know, you have to be at a hundred percent all the time. And like, you can't, you can't show weakness. And just like the permission, as you said, to feel and the permission to, um, you know, not be at this, quote unquote, positive place all the time, just lifts the burden. So I'm, I'm really excited about going into and it's this. Like, no as way. you said, like, it's not real. Yeah. You know, like if you're a teacher, like kindergarten teachers, I always say like they have the worst job because they got to be positive all the time. Good morning, boys and girls. Hello, everybody. And it's like, they may have had a really rough morning and they have to like put on this face and it really can affect their health and wellness. Special education teachers have the same right challenge because a lot of times they're feeling deep em empathy and they're frustrated, you know, with their, even themselves or their students. And so point being, you can express all emotions as an adult, as long as you make sure that the kids who you're working with don't feel like they have to take care of you. So you've got to demonstrate, I have the feelings, but I have the strategies to manage them. And that's the co-regulation piece, which is that, you know, we, whether we like it or not, emotions are contagious. Mm. So as a mom, if you have like a couple of kids and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you know, like you don't have to even say anything to your kids and all of a sudden they're feeling anxious. And what's really interesting about this contagion is that it happens subconsciously. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden your kid is feeling anxious and they can't even describe why, but it's because they're witnessing all the anxiety around them. So we have to be really mindful as adults, teachers, of our facial expressions, our body language, our vocal tones, so that we create environments that are helping kids to deactivate as opposed to activate them. I, that's, you know, that's actually something that's really relevant to me too. I was recently going through an old box and saw a picture of a family member who had passed away and I teared up and my daughter came over to me and like made a sad face and she said, mommy cry. And I said, yeah. And then she started crying and she said, Lucy cry. And she had never met this family member. She didn't know why I was sad, but she could tell I was sad. And then she just started crying too. And like her whole body language changed. And I was, I didn't even know she knew the word sad and cry. And like mm -hmm. she immediately felt like within seconds could feel it. So that's so true. The co-regulation she's under two years old and, and felt that. Yeah, so you just have to let her know. The re you always want to explain cause and effect. Mommy's crying. These are happy tears. Mommy is thinking about someone who she loves a lot and who she misses. And then, again, it's normal to cry. and It's not like this is a bad thing or a good thing. Absolutely. Oh, I love it. I'm going to cry right now. <laughs> well, um, I know you've prepared for us. Yes. So as, as a parent, as an educator, I love some steps. I love yeah. some concrete and you have some steps for us right yeah i have a four-step program <laughs> all right let's do it all right let's go to step one so step one is you just have to set yourself up for success right if you're you know if your kid is let's say acting out it's like is this really the best place to do this right now in front of everybody make sure you're not hungry or you're not tired um you know be aware you know like my parents were not very skilled in this area so my mother, when I would say, I hate school, she would get angry at me for hating school. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I'm the one who's not having a good time. <laughs> like, why are you mad at me? <laughs> so like, be aware of what you're bringing into the situation, 
remember to pause as the adult. Remember to deactivate yourself first. Be aware of how you're feeling. Try to be calm before you really have the conversation. And what I say is try to be your best self. And this is an exercise that we do in our training, which is just take a moment. I'm going to ask you to do this, Jenny, right now. As a mom, as a teacher, whatever your role is, my best self has these qualities. And then you fill it in. So when you think about the ideal mom, what do you what comes up for you? I think the ideal mom is compassionate. I think patient. Um, I you know a good a good model, good like trying to role model a balance too, not just completely being selfish, but self selfless or selfish, but showing like self care as well. Mm -hmm. I could go on. I've been reading a lot of books recently on what it means to be a good parent. So, but like you said, patient, you said, what was the other one? Caring or yeah. compassionate. So like, think about this, you know, most of the time, like you said, you're overwhelmed, you're rushed. Let me ask you this. How often before you interact with your child, do you pause, take a deep breath and say, I'm going to show up in my daughter's bedroom when I see her this morning as the mom who is patient and compassionate. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure I do. I think I just kind of go, you know, she wakes me up at 6 a.m. and I kind of stumble in um, and I try and be the best version of myself. But you're right. I don't know how much that that self-talk happens. Sometimes when I'm frustrated, I do. You know, I told I told you last time that I was frustrated at the dinner table um, on Monday night. And, and I was like, oh, I need to be patient. I need to, you know, take a step, but not all the time. Well, what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that this becomes like an intentional practice. Yeah. That like, even in your little bathroom, you have a, you have like compassionate, patient, whatever the words are. And like, you're just priming yourself to be that mom. And it just, it, it, it helps you enter into a situation with a completely different mindset. than when you wake up, like I do, <gasps> I got all these emails to respond to. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> That's exactly it. You relate to that? Yeah, yeah. I wake up and I'm like, oh my gosh, we got to get out of the house. We got to do this. I'm going to be late. She's going to be exactly. late. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So let's go to step two. Step two is as you lead with compassion and empathy, right? Just know that that is a strategy in and of itself to help your child feel more connected and calm, right? You're going to make sure you're monitoring your facial expressions and your, your vocal tones. And then you're being that compassionate scientist as opposed to the critical judge, right? You're using gentle exploration. You're giving your child undivided attention. You're listening. You're asking questions. You're not telling them what they're feeling. Even if it looks like they're angry, you don't say, oh, you're angry again. Or, or why are you always so sad in the mornings? We want to really avoid the attri attribution or the telling kids how they're feeling. Mm. And instead, listen and learn and help them label their feelings accurately. So that's step two. It's listening, learning, and labeling. And then step three is really helping them find the strategy. So once we've named it's anger or it's disappointment or it's frustration, then we say, okay, let's think about this. So what do you need right now, honey? Or let's try this. Let's do some breathing exercises. Let's just bring ourselves down a little bit. Or let's work on a new way, you know, to think about this. You know, I have a niece um, who is one of my favorite people. Uh, she's adopted from Guatemala. And uh, she was living in an area of New York where there weren't a lot of kids of color. And she was badly bullied by some kids in her school, which was in kindergarten. Could you imagine? And, of course, her mom calls me and says, you know, get up here right now. I need you to help me with this. And... So here was my niece having a lot of negative self thinking, you know, about the color of her skin. Um, all, you know, it was really terrible. And so it was like our obligation, right, to help Esme think about the situation differently, right? And how do you, you have to work developmentally? And, you know, the, the moral of my whole story was that I had to teach Esme that other people cannot define her reality for her. So how do you do that to a kindergartner? You say, well, look, you've got family members who are all different colored skin. Um, you know, 
do you really think that you know that's um, I, why why tell me why why would it be bad to look different? You know, let's think about that. Like, and all of a sudden, I saw the the fear and the anxiety in her face kind of get softer and you know more calm because she had an adult, her mom and me, who were helping her to shift her thinking. And I would say of all the strategies that we have in psychology, what we have to try to do with our kids is help them move away from having negative self-talk and move them towards having a more positive self-talk. And that just takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, but it's worth everything. Great. And I think that it's um, it's hard because sometimes we model that negative self-talk too. I think that you know we're hard on ourselves. So I, I, I've tried to be conscious about trying to be more positively framed in front of my daughter. So um, it doesn't, and that's important. What you're saying, Jenny, is that you don't have to be like fake positive. Like everything's going to be fine. Like you yeah. can't say that. Like right now, like everything might not be fine. But yeah. what you can say is, "Mommy's here for you." Right. We're going to like today, we're going to do this together. And I'm so excited to spend time with you. And we're going to do this. You know, we're going to read this book together. Um, and just framing things in a way, you know, that makes sure your kids like, let's think about it. We live in a world right now where, you know, you can, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too dark, you're too light, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too gay, you're too straight. I mean, like it's endless, you know, how my, how we can make things negative. And I think what we have to let people know is that you're per, you're not, you're, you're great just who you are. Like there's no, like no one has the right to, and I'm going to say this in like fancy terms, no one has the right to define your reality for you. So it's like helping your kids grow up in a way where they have a sense of agency, right? And, um, and clarity. Um, and pride in who they are, as opposed to what happens, unfortunately, we often get uh, not, not a lot of negativity. Yeah, and I, I've seen so many educators sharing great resources out there about helping students see themselves in, in media and the books that they have on the shelves um, and, and just see positive representations about that. And I think it speaks to what you're saying of having that positive self-talk and positive self-image. And the last piece is really just making sure you follow up you know, when I was a kid who was bullied, once everything was fine, oh good, now he's not being bullied anymore. History repeats itself, you know, so you just have to be really careful. Like if your kid is feeling disappointment about something, check in a day or two later, say, hey honey, you know, is it working out if they're angry at a friend? So, you know, let's, how's it going with your friend? Just really just making sure that you are following up to make sure whatever strategy you help them with, like positive self-talk, is working for them. That's and I think that's true. Like all all learning with students, like you're not done. You're not like check nailed it. You've got that. You have to keep reinforcing it. We were just talking um, earlier, the interpreter and I, about how I actually took the same amount of American Sign Language instruction as as a young person as she did. But I remember none of it. I remember like thank you and like how to spell my name, whereas she is brilliantly translating like live translating what i'm saying right mm -hmm. now like i think this is this now i don't know i don't even remember that <laughs> so exactly continued applying it she followed up she came back to it so that she could grow that skill and i did it well what you're reminding me of is that emotion regulation is a muscle mm -hmm. just like you know going to the gym it's a muscle and i think what parents need to know also about this work and teachers is that there is no right or wrong strategy. We, we do this work because we want to help our children have ways of thinking about themselves that helps them have well-being, build and maintain positive relationships, and achieve their goals at school, in work, and in life. And that's a continuous exploration. Like right now, I never expected that, like I would be so anxious and neurotic about being in quarantine and social distancing. Like I just, I couldn't plan for this. Mm -hmm. So like I'm being put to the test again and life is going to be always about putting ourselves to the test. And I think appreciating that 
makes it less burdensome. Mm -hmm. Like just know, like this is an area of who I am that's going to be evolving for my life. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Embrace, embrace, embrace the imperfection. Um, well, you know, I, I have so many questions I want to ask you, but I want to share the air. And we have a lot of people who are watching sure. questions. So yeah, let's take some. Off, um, with Tanika has a question about codependency. Mm -hmm. um, can children suffer from codependency? What should we be looking for and what should we do? Of course. I mean, many of us as adults suffer from codependency, right? <laughs> um, some of us want independence right now. <laughs> that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but um, yes. And so that's about, you know, creating space for your, you know, a lot of times I think what happens with codependency is that we haven't given our children enough time for autonomy. And so like gradually, right, you have to help your child find ways to um, do things that are creative on their own, you know, without your presence. You don't want to just abandon them if they have that codependency. It's like five minutes this week and then 10 minutes the next week, just trying to help your kid build that autonomy. Oftentimes that comes from having an insecure attachment. So like just reinsuring to your child that you're there for them, but it's important, you know, mommy's going to go over here and you're going to play over here and I'm going to I'll see you in 10 minutes and make sure you check in in 10 minutes so that trust is built. So as we're thinking about building building trust, you know, I was a math teacher and a lot of my students would come into my first day of class and not trust me right away because they didn't like math. And um, Nanang brings this up as a question, like how do we deal with children who've experienced trauma to a subject? So the subject itself is creating uh, negative feelings. So again, we never want to tell them not to feel that way. You know, it's understandable, you know, that you have these feelings. Um, let's talk about why and let's find out the reason behind it. Is it a learning challenge? Is it that you had poor instruction? Um, is it that you just have general anxiety around learning abstract concepts? So the more you can name, you know, you know, the challenge, the easier it will be to help you support the child in finding a strategy to help them be more engaged. And again, I think always we as the teachers just have to show that we love these kids unconditionally, um, that we're never going to judge them for their challenges. Um, and then we also have to show our passion and for the work that we do. So when we have students in class and, you know, we're, we're really on a roll and, and we notice that they have um, some serious emotions that, that need to be addressed. What do we do um, when we can't address them in the middle of the class? So while he goes asking, he has, I think this person has a lot of teenagers who bring in a lot of that, extra hormones and, and more complexity mm -hmm. in their lives. And you feel as an educator, I should address this, but this isn't the time and space. Do you have any recommendations for that? Well, I think hopefully, you know, the school has a counselor or a psychologist. So I would try to make sure that child gets the support they need. Um, we don't want our teachers to have to be, you know, clinical psychologists with kids because that's not the training that they have. Um, so I think supporting, you know, finding out, you know, what the student is feeling and what's the cause of that feeling, letting them know, you know, that our goal here is for this. I really want you to be doing this with me and finding strategies to support the here and the now and a little bit of like compartmentalizing. And so that, you know, a lot of kids who come from, you know, high trauma backgrounds or have high trauma um school is like the place that's a haven and so my what i what i hope this educator can do is just create the the safest you know most welcoming learning environment for this child because at least then they can be deactivated as much as possible in that environment to be the best possible learner thank you um, and, and finally, we have one other question, and it's about um, any tips to help regulate students' emotion while we're teaching remotely. So it's, it's sometimes hard to feel that through a video screen. 
So how do we help regulate when we can't be with them in 3D? So that's when you can use group strategies. Remember, as I said earlier, emotions are co-regulated. So that means that you can set the emotion goal for the classroom. So let's say you have a mood meter and you show it you know, in your Google Classroom or wherever you're showing it, and everybody's plotting and you learn either through the class or privately, um, you know, that four of your kids are in the red and three are in the blue and five are in the yellow, whatever it might be. And you're thinking to yourself, well, right now, let's say it's like second grade, we're gonna do like a read aloud for history. And I really want my kids to be in the green quadrant, like calm and relaxed. Mm. So maybe I say, you know, we're gonna play a little music, put a little classical music on. Um, everyone, you know, I know that some people are coming from, didn't get enough sleep and some of you are struggling here, but you know what? Let's do a little breathing exercise together because we're gonna move into history. Where we're gonna do this read aloud and you put the music on and you just like create the conditions for the sense of calm. So that's called group emotion regulation. And it's just trying your best, right? If you want kids to be all excited and jumping up and down, put on a little Lady Gaga or something like that, right? And maybe not, depends on you know what you're able to do in your classroom, but some kind of energizing music um, and um, or talk a little faster or like get everybody up and stretching and moving. So you wanna try to do things that align with the feeling. Green quadrant, calm, calming music, calming voice, breathing exercises, yellow quadrant, high energy, you know, movement, etc. cetera. And I didn't have an idea that the other thing that um, is that, that match mood I wanted, that I wanted my students to be in. So I love that you brought in music. And I also want to name, and I'll put this in the comments so folks can see, uh, our, actually, our team will put this in the comments so folks can see. You had mentioned doing kind of like a, a, a mindfulness exercise to yeah. folks. Um, we had a great um, EV on air about a month or two ago with Carla Tintilla Fulabere, who I know you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We did some mindfulness exercises. So, if folks are looking for some tips, uh, check out the chat over here or down here, depending on what platform you're on, so that you can uh, check out that archived EV on air. Well, Mark, I just want to thank you so much for your time once again. Um, thank you. Two to three minute segments were not enough. We need to all mm -hmm. roll in like a year mm -hmm. course with you. Uh, but for now, for folks who want more uh, more from Dr. Brackett, again, check out his amazing book. He also, thank you. He also have a really amazing podcast with uh, Brene Brown. I, I heard that a while ago, too. Yes. Yeah. So there are a lot of great places you can learn more. And go to markbrackett.com. That's Mark with a C and two T's in bracket.com. And you can dig into uh, more of his insights. So thank you, Dr. Brackett, so much for spending this time with us. And thank you, Jenny. It was fun. Good luck, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone.